Well, the story is told of a young girl who professed Christ as her Savior and applied for membership in a local church. Were you a sinner before you received the Lord Jesus into your life? Inquired the pastor. Yes, sir, she replied. Well, are you still a sinner? To tell you the truth, I feel like I'm a greater sinner than ever, she said. Then what real change have you experienced, said the pastor. I don't quite know how to explain it, she said, except I used to be a sinner running after sin, but now that I'm saved, I'm a sinner running from it. She was received into the fellowship of the church, and she proved her consistent life through that, that she was truly converted. Folks, we need to understand what it means to be sanctified or, or set apart for a holy purpose. And so our, today our goal is to understand and internalize the definition of sanctification in our lives. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you'll turn with me to the book of Genesis. As we continue our study in Genesis, we're in chapter 35 this morning. I'll begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 35 in Genesis. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourself and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all of the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called it, called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So he called his, its name Alan Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. And then they journeyed from Bethel. When they were still some distance and from Ephrath, Rachel went into labor and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. While Israel lived in the land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant, Dan, and Naphtali, the sons of Zilphah, Leah's servant, Gad, and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Paddan Aram. 
And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre in Kirath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last, and he died, and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So last week, our text left us observing Israel, realizing the situation brought about by Hamor and Shechem's deception and their schemes to try to integrate the two peoples together there. And of course, his two sons' reaction to the occurrence with Dinah, where his two sons go in and commit mass murder, with leave them, leaves them with really no choice but to depart from that land and to go really to where God commanded him to go in the first place. So if you'll look back with me to verse 1 of chapter 35, at the beginning of our text here, we see that God affirms Israel's decision to leave. And God tells him to go ahead and return to Bethel, which is where he told him to go in the first place, of course, back to where he promised God what he would do if God took care of him. Just rewind back a couple of weeks now, if you remember, that Jacob made some promises to God there back in chapter 28. Now go back there, and if you look in chapter 28, in verse 18 and following there, So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city was Luz at the first. You remember we just read that, you know, that it repeated that in our text today. And then Jacob made a vow, this is on his way out, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all of that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. And you remember we talked about that this was, this was Jacob and he's being prepared for the call on his life that God is going to make. And God makes him his God, right? And so here he is back in the land. He's back to this place now. And what you see here is that instruction of God in chapter 35 really addresses those latter two where he's going to make a place of worship and he is going to give that offering that he promised God that he would give him because God, in fact, has blessed him and poured out on him far more than I would imagine that Jacob would have ever dreamed. Has that ever happened to you? Has God ever blessed you beyond measure? And you look back and say, boy, I'll tell you, that's just far and above away what, what, what I prayed for. You know, and as I, as I look back, uh, when I was very lonely, and I was crying out to God and, and weeping for him to, uh, to, to help me find a wife, and a week later, I met this fine lady right here, and let me tell you what, friends, you want to talk about the pouring out of blessing over and above. My cup overflows and continues to overflow far and away. Maybe you've experienced that. Well, Jacob's experiencing that today in becoming Israel. And of course now, that's, that's, that's what the Jewish nation is referred to. These millions and millions of Jews are, are, are descendants of Jacob. But look at what the text says happens here. It says that the people around them were fearful of them. And if we look closely at, at verse 5 there, you'll see that it says that there was a terror from God that was on the people. You know what that is, friends? That's a hedge of protection. That's a hedge of protection. You know, I have prayed... From the time that my, my two sons were, were in the womb individually, I, I prayed that God would place a hedge of protection around them spiritually, emotionally, physically. 
Oh, I hope you pray for that for your kids and for your grandkids, that God would protect them. Because, you know, friends, we can't protect them. We can only prepare them. But God can place that hedge of protection around them. So this hedge of protection is around Jacob and his family, his clan at this point, if you will. So Israel returns to this place where he began this relationship, where God first introduced himself to Jacob. Drop down to verse 9 with me now. Verses 9 through 15 here, what we see, friends, is the repetition of the Abrahamic covenant to Israel one more time. Why does he do this? Why does he repeat what he said before? I am El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. That's, that's, that's that quality of God. He's, the, he's that provider. He's that all-powerful provider, El Shaddai. And so he's reminding Jacob where his blessings come from there. So Israel brings his family to, into close proximity to these foreign people. Let's remember what happened there. Hamor and Shechem, who schemed in order to intermingle with Israel's family so that they could take their property. But instead, you see, the circumstances brought about by Israel's disobedience and not going back to Bethel, which is where God told them to go, actually caused them to have to leave. So instead of Israel becoming part of their culture, the people of Shechem actually become part of Israel's culture. And their God is, is wiped away. And his God becomes their God, see? What's going on here? God is sanctifying Israel. He's setting them apart for his holy purpose. Setting them apart. But notice that he doesn't isolate Israel. He doesn't isolate them. He makes them an influencer instead of an influencee. Maybe you've heard that the Bible says we're in the world but not of the world. What that says, friends, is we're not to isolate ourselves. We're not just to take ourselves out of the game. But we're not to be the influencee of the culture. We're to be the influencer of the culture. To be influencers, to be light in a dark place. I mean, can you relate to that? Circumstances of life put us in circumstances and situations that cause us to have to either be the influencer or to be influenced by that circumstance. Will we stand strong? Will we stand strong in a, in a culture that is more and more becoming hateful toward the name of Jesus Christ and who you and I are called Christian? Will we stand firm? And will we be the influencer or will we be influenced? You know, the story goes that Do Dr. John Getty went to... Anatium in 1848 and he worked there for God for 24 years and on the tablet that's erected there in memory these words are inscribed it says this when he landed in 1848 there were no Christians when he left in 1872 there were no heathens oh Lord that would be our prayer that we would be light in a dark place and that everywhere we go, as we encounter the lost, Lord, that they would see and, and let others, let, that we would let others see Jesus in us. And they would come to saving faith, not because of anything that we do, but because what, what God has done in us, it shines through. Talk about influence. A mother took her young son shopping, and after a day at the stores, a clerk handed the little boy a lollipop, at which the mother said, what do you say? And the boy replied, charge it. <laughs> See, it's not, it's not do as I say, it's do as I do, right? Years ago, true story, the communist government in China commissioned an author to write a biography of Hudson Taylor with the purpose of distorting the facts and presenting him in a bad light. They wanted to discredit the name of that consecrated missionary of the gospel. And as the author was doing his research, he was increasingly impressed by Taylor's saintly character and godly life. And he found it extremely difficult to carry out his assigned task with a clear conscience. Eventually, at the risk of losing his life, he laid aside his pen, 
renounced atheism and professed Jesus as his personal savior, oh friends, if someone were to write a biography on your life, wouldn't it be your prayer that they would come to saving faith in Christ as a result of what they found? Whether we realize it or not, our example leaves an impression on others. Of course, we have to remember, there, there's this sign in an executive's office that I saw. It says, what I'm about to say represents one four billionth of the world's opinion. Just making sure you're still awake, all right? All right. It's not our opinions, friends, right? It's our character. It's our character. Something very interesting in verse 16. Take a look at it with me, if you will. There's, there's a significance of these two events. What we see here is Rachel's death and then this, this, this indiscretion with Reuben uh, and his father's concubine. The eldest son, Reuben, would have had the birthright and he would inherit the human members of the household as the firstborn. His, he has the birthright. Okay? So his actions of doing this prior to his father's death are an effort to usurp the authority of his father, you see, at this point in time. Remember what Absalom did to David in that same, in that same way. So anyway, the chapter wraps up with an affirmation to its original audience, of course, is Israel, that God has ordained the 12 tribes of Israel and set them apart for holy purposes. And so, as you might imagine, you can certainly guess what our takeaway is today. Being set apart for a holy purpose, to be sanctified, to be holy. Are we sanctified? As, as, as the body of Christ, are we sanctified? You know, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 and following, talks about this new covenant. And there's a lot of I wills there. And then it talks about and causing them to walk in my statutes and obey my laws. You see, friends, as, 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 new, as new believers, we begin to realize that there was this change in our life. And we begin to recognize the, the, the unction of the Holy Spirit prompting us and knowing what the heart of God is and the desire to be pleasing in the mind and the eyes of God. And that doesn't go away. We can quench the Holy Spirit. We can, we, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. But that unction of, of doing what's pleasing in the sight of God never goes away for us as, as, as believers, friends. Because you see, we're set, a, set apart for the holy, holy purposes of God. There are different kinds of sanctification. There are different, different phases of sanctification that we go through. And the first one is preparatory sanctification. This is prior to that conversion, prior to that regeneration, where the Lord is preparing the soil of our hearts to receive the truth. He's, he's providing that fertile soil and, and the fertilizer and everything that goes into when that seed of it, that it will flourish and grow and that it will bear fruit. Preparatory sanctification. And perhaps you remember that time where you're questioning and wondering and beginning to ponder who God is and what, this, what it means to be a Christian and who, who this, this, this guy Jesus is and so forth. And then, then at some point, there is what we call positional sanctification. And that's the very moment, friends, where the Lord has regenerated you and he's torn out that, that, that sin nature and replaced it with a new nature. Positional sanctification. Sealed until the day of redemption guaranteed by the Holy Spirit and that sealing of the Holy Spirit. What I want to talk about today, friends, is progressive sanctification. Once you and I become believers, there is this progress of, of spiritual development, this progress of spiritual growth. And we're talking on Wednesday, and we're, we're going to actually, you might have seen on the screen that we're looking at some of the, uh, the Pauline epistles. We're going through 1 Timothy, and we were talking about spiritual gifts versus bearing fruit. And as, as we looked at bearing fruit, that kind of looks like nebulous. You know, when, when you say bearing fruit, what, what, what does that mean? And some of us get the, the, the misunderstanding of bearing fruit is works. Of course, you know, when we talk about works, works can be motivated, properly motivated by, by the Spirit. 
and having right motives. And works can be motivated by uh, self-gain and self-recognition and so forth. So, I mean, it can be deceptive there. But when we talk about bearing fruit, friends, what we're talking about is this progress of sanctification as we continue to grow and, and develop as believers. And I want to focus on the spiritual disciplines. And I'm going to share those with you. Certainly it could be a complete sermon series on each one of them. So we're just going to touch on them today and maybe return to them uh, from time to time. But this, this progressive sanctification is what we're going to focus on today. Finally, what we'll look to is, is perfected sanctification. And that is, of course, with the return of Christ as we meet him in the air, we'll get our new bodies. And so our bodies will be in, in sync with our, our new nature. And there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more sin, no more suffering, and so forth. You know, I think we get the wrong idea about salvation. I think a lot of times as, as new Christians, as baby Christians, we, we think that the, the pinnacle of the Christian life is salvation. You know, and, and you get saved, and you know, boom, and, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's what it's all about. But there could be nothing further from the truth. You see, friends, end game is not salvation. End game is maximum glory to God, bringing maximum glory to God. And salvation is the vehicle for that. You know, if you look at 1 Corinthians, over in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 10, in verse 31, describes this. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And every time I mention that word all, I always kind of kind of jokingly say, you know, if we even go back to the original language, the Greek, all still means all. All still means all. When it says do all to the glory of God, that means everything that you do, every waking minute. Every waking minute is to be, everything we do is to be the, to the glory of God. And Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 kind of speaks in the same way. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. In the name of Jesus. You know, it's not just... Uh, you know, right before you eat your meal, when you say, in Jesus' name, it's not just right at the end of every prayer when you say, in Jesus' name. It's everything you do in Jesus' name to his glory. Remember, God did not isolate Israel from the peoples and the surrounding nations. He made them the influencers of them. And when he says, you're my chosen people, what he didn't mean is just because you have the DNA of Abraham in you, I'm going to snatch you up and you're going to spend eternity with me. What he meant was, I'm going to reveal myself to the world through you. And you know who God's chosen people is today? You and I. You and I. We are the influencers of this nation, of this world. You and I are to be light in a dark place. Over in 1 Peter... Chapter 2. I'll get there. In 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9, it says, But you, that's us, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it speaks to 
the fact that we're ambassadors. And you know, as, as, as ambassadors, I mean, think about that, that metaphor of, of ambassador. You know, if we have an ambassador, say, to, uh, to Iran or an ambassador to China, that ambassador cannot do anything or make any promises or make any statements to that nation that they have not been empowered to do by the nation that they represent. You and I are Christ's ambassadors. Look what it says here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and following. For the love of Christ, look at what the word is there, controls us. Controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. I'm going to keep going. <clears throat> From now on, what? As a result of the fact that he regenerated us. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. I'll clarify that for a second. In other words, we're not looking at people for what they do. We look at people and they have two categories, lost and saved. We regard no one according to the flesh any longer, lost and saved. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. All what? The regeneration of the believer who through Christ reconciled himself, us to himself, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself and not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. It's been trust, entrusted to you and I. You and I are the influencers. We're the messengers of the truth of the gospel, friends. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are ambassadors for the gospel of Jesus Christ, friends. So how do we bring maximum glory to God? By being his ambassadors, by being the influencers, by being his chosen people. In order to do that, we need to love. You know, love is unconditional. Agape love is unconditional. You, you don't have to like somebody to love them with agape. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 talks about that. Love is patient. There's a reason that that's the first rattle out of the bag, by the way. Let me, let me give you a little caution. Be careful about praying for patience. God will give you a lot of opportunities to exercise patience when you pray for it. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It's not rude. It doesn't brag. It doesn't seek its own. It does not take into account the wrong sufferer. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never fails. And friends, that love cannot be expressed by our own efforts. It must be expressed by surrendering control to the Spirit and letting the Spirit of God love through us. And as we do that, friends, we become the influencers and people begin to see the love of Christ through us and are drawn to it. It's an attractional, it's an attractional faith. And so here's my challenge in our daily quiet time. We don't have time to go through every one of these. I'll give you a very cursory overview of the practice of the spiritual disciplines. When we talk about bearing fruit, these are the things that grow. You know, fruit develops. You know, it starts off, you know, at, you know on the tree and then it grows and develops and then it becomes ripe. 
and becomes something that, that, that's, that's edible, right? So the, here in this time from 10.30 to 11.30-ish, worship, right? Hey, sometimes I give you a little, sometimes I give you, take a little bit more, right? So I, I'm looking back, you know, I go through the sermons and I watch them, you know, so that I can point out some of the things. One thing is I notice that I do, you know, I'm probably making you dizzy because you see that I like shift back and forth. I don't know, it's my, it must be my hip or something. But anyway, I watch them, and as I look at them, some of them are 20 minutes long, and others like 40, and one I think was like an hour. And I was like, boy, that was really over the top. <laughs> Whatever what, right? Whatever the Lord has. It, it's his, they're His words, and I pray that they, they be His words. Corporate worship, prayer, right? We, we pray together. We, we, we sing praises to our God together. We fellowship together. And the sermon, all that is corporate worship. Guidance. I hope you have someone in your life that you value as someone who is more spiritually mature than you, who speaks into your life, that you can share your joys and your struggles with and look for guidance. And I hope that as, as a more mature Christian that you're looking for someone to mentor. And then finally, celebration. You know what celebration is, friends? It is the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah, we, we sing that sometimes, but do we believe it? You know, even, even in the darkest, dankest time of our life, isn't the joy of the Lord our strength? I mean, if everything comes unraveled, if everything comes unglued, and we are a regenerated being who will spend eternity with the Lord, isn't that a joy? Isn't that a joy? The spiritual disciplines, friends. And as we practice them, as we, as we develop them, it's like, it's like anything else. The more you, you cultivate something, the better you become at it. You know, it's, you know if you're a, a sports person, it's that muscle memory, you know, for the baseball player, that, that batting swing. And sometimes they get in a slump, they go back, they watch the videos, they go back over all of the, the things that they are doing and make sure that they're following the rudiments and they get better and they improve. And, I don't know if, you know, any, anyone who's ever played any sport, you know, you, there's these levels. And you think, oh, that person's the, the, the greatest person. You know, we were a member of, of Racquet Club of the South when we were in Atlanta, Georgia. And the club champion, the club champion, nobody could even get a point on this person, won the opportunity to go to the AT&T Challenge, which is like one of the tour things that were, were in Atlanta that people, all the people on the tour came to. And they got to play against Andre Agassi, who was like the number one player at, at the time. You tell you how old I am now. He's the number one player. And this guy, who, who nobody could get a point off as a club champion, could not get one point off of, off of Andre Agassi. You just, you know, and just there's there's different levels, you know, and it, and it's it's the same thing for the for these corporate disciplines as we practice them, as we continue to grow in the faith, as we continue to grow closer to the Lord. You see that fruit, the bearing of fruit, and that's what we're all about, friends. That's what we're all about. When we go out there in the world, you and I are to be Jesus with skin on. You and I are to be light in a dark place. It's not just about getting saved and then saying hallelujah and coming together once, once a week like a club. It's coming here to develop and cultivate that the culture that we can go out and reach the lost and win the lost. And so that's my challenge to you this week, friends. But as you look at the, at the, at the disciplines and, and, and just, just check yourself. Where am I on these? Am I, am I even aware of them? And if not, I want to challenge you to, to, to either come to me or, or someone in your life and begin to think about those, those practicing of bearing fruit. Will you do it?